Next piece I'm going to do is the flywheel, only because it just looks like too much fun not to do. It's about time to have a little bit of fun. And this drawing is really not representative of the cross section of the flywheel. The flywheel does seem to taper down as it gets towards the outer hub, and that to me spells trouble. If you were to just support this by the center and try to face and turn this, I'm going to suspect it's going to want to ring and chatter and show up in the finish. And we'll try it. I'll try holding it by the hub and putting a center in it and taking it real easy. But I suspect this is going to be a bear when it comes right down to it. Center is no big deal. It's a 375 diameter through. It should slip fit nicely over the crank. And the angled set screw that they expect you to put in there, if your tap does not go far enough, you're going to need something called a pulley tap. Very appropriately named. I do not have pulley taps here, but I do have an idea on how to get around that. So let's grab a hold of this thing, and the first thing I'm going to do is set it up in my mill just to hold it, and I'm going to deburr everything that needs to be deburred. This is a highly visible part, and a concentric perception is very important here. You definitely want the ID concentric to the OD and everything to look like it's standing still when it's running. This is a highly visible part, so if there's any piece that needs a little bit of finesse, it's this one. Alright, put it in the mill, check it out. It's always nice to do hand work on a part when you can hold it. So I've got a simple setup here in my machine. A couple of leftover one inch square pieces of aluminum in the vise. This gives me access to everything that I need to do. Decent amount of rigidity. And we'll start there. No sense in showing the handwork. I will show you what I'm going after when I am done. But these parting lines here, they need to go away. All these sharp edges need to go away. I'm going to use a relatively coarse file here, probably about 3 eighths of an inch wide. And I'm going to try to maintain the rounds in the corners so that there's nothing that looks out of skew when I'm done. It will certainly show up when it spins. So let me do some handwork on this part and we'll get back to you. Let's take a look at the effort it's going to take to blend this out. I am using a well abused half round file. Relatively coarse. And I will probably do this 50-50. I may do it from one side and then flip it over and do it from the other side just for uniformity. But I'm looking for this ridge to go away and form a nice edge in there without undercutting the corners. I think you get the idea there's no sense in filming the uh, 45 minutes it's going to take to do this but I will show you when it's done because I'm going to take great pride in making this look like it just came out of a mold uh, without all this nasty stuff sticking to it we'll be back I had originally promised myself that I wasn't going to film this whole operation but I think that there's a lot of a lot of value in this particular demonstration this parting line right here is like the surface of the moon. It's very irregular. Not only is it irregular, but it's off center to the back side. So if these were two pieces and you just slid your fingers and just separate them, one would be higher than the other. So the edge that you may be seeing here is like a wave coming over the top. On the bottom, it's like a wave going under the bottom. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a file and I'm going to file this until it's flat. Just make a nice little non-pitted, non-reflective, or actually it's going to be quite reflective, non-pitted edge right there. No radius, no nothing, just a flat. And I hope the camera stays in focus because this is worth seeing. Now as you file it, you'll see the low spots start to come through 
as dark spots. I want them all out, all the way across. Take nice long sweeps from side to side. That'll keep you from furrowing this particular surface and give you a better shot at a straight edge. All right. Nice clean surface on top. That much I like. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this surface on top and I'm going to take out the ridges on the side. So I want to see a nice transition blend going up. I'm going to try to do this so that I only cut to the center of the flat that I just put on there. At about a 20 degree angle. Now I'm going to decrease the angle. The blend is much cleaner. There's no visible rib, at least from this side. I still have to check the back side. This is not something I can do all from one side just because of the way it's set up. I suppose we could do this a little bit down here. You see the little pit marks in that? rest of it looks pretty good. Maybe a little by the hub. Let's see if we can clean that out. Alright, it is a casting and the paint will cover a lot of your ills, but if you take the hard lines out of it, you should be okay. I think that's well worth the time it takes to do that. I will finish these corners off with a small round file to keep a radius in that corner. Keep the integrity of the look. You can see the back side is considerably more irregular than the front. That's a nice round blend right there. Alright, let's keep going. To better illustrate that particular technique, this rib here is only flat on top. The leading and trailing surfaces on that, well, I guess it's going to be leading or trailing, but from where I'm standing, one is one or the other. I will do the back side first, since that's the most reflective. I'm going to actually approach this from the front, and I'm going to down file on the back side. And you can see the edge that that's on there right now. That is probably acceptable with paint on it but I just want to go the extra distance I want that to be a nice smooth line to the center of this track that's better you can get a pretty good look at how ratty the back is ratty the front is let's clean it up so it's a nice reflective edge backside first And a little less of an angle. Let's do the front. Thank <laughs> you. 
I am watching the reflection because you can control the width of that line. Keep the file at the same angle all the way across. Work the wide spots down to meet the low sides. I think you have what you like. Give it a little bit of finesse. When you're happy with what you have. And boy, it looks a whole lot better standing where I'm standing than it does through the camera. I'm going to give it a little shoe shine with the emery. And there is your final result. Straight, nice smooth blend. And you've got to stop somewhere. This is casting and you'll have nothing left if you keep going. Alright, I thought that was worth seeing close up. Okay, our post filing effort. I'm looking at both sides of the arc on the inside of each of the spokes trying to line up in the same spot. It'll be really obvious if it doesn't. I did take a small file and go around the fillets or the radius on the bottom. That is nice and clean now. I'm very pleased with this. I'm going to put this in the blaster, take the shine off of it. Let's take another look when it comes out two minutes from now. And we are out of blast. Out of the blaster, let's put it that way. Nice and clean. I like it. Now bear in mind it is a casting, it is porous, and you may file on that same black dot all day and it's not going to go away. That means it's a hole. Stop filing. So know when to say when, and I think you'll probably be in good shape. Next thing we're going to do is hold it in the collet and just get a visual on how everything runs. I expect this thing to just scream like nobody's business when, we, when I try to turn the OD on it. Chances are I will hold the OD and do face the sides, but it would be nice to have a clean OD to hold on to. Let's see what it looks like in the collet. Well, you have to start somewhere when you're working with a casting, and deburn it is the first place I started. I am now holding it in a collet on the hub on the back side of the wheel. I'm going to fire up the machine at a slow RPM, and I'm going to look for anything that's running concentric. I would ideally love to see the small center hub running true and the inside where the spokes terminate I would love to see that running true everything else you can work with but that's maybe that's not going to be the case ideally if I have to do anything I will take a small error in the center hub and I would love to see the inside of the rim running true that is going to be a highly visible area and something that you just can't address unless you're going to put it on a rotary table or a CNC and that's really not part of the project here. So let's turn it on take a look. One hundred thirty RPM. Now it's, if you look at the countersunk screw, look at my hand, if you look at this screw in the headstock versus the inside of the rim against the shadow in the outside here that keeps opening and closing versus the, uh, the eccentric. It is hard to tell which is running out more. 
The hub in the center is definitely running out. That's unpleasant to see. And then profile. We have a little bit of run out in profile, but not much. I would imagine we're going to see exactly the same error on the other side if we do chug it up. So I think I'm going to get away from a collet on this particular operation and put it in an adjustable three jaw and try to dial out that error on the inside of the wheel. That is where I'm going to start. Let's do it. Part is sitting in the three jaw and I believe that I have the inside diameter. Inside the rim right here running as true as I could possibly get it. You just can't trust the outside. Let's see if I can set something up there so we can get a good look at that. Right there, let's see what that looks like. Look at the gap between the tip of the pencil and the inside of the rim. I also have to take into consideration if it's running out, if it's whipping, because it may be moving closer and running concentric. Still a little too far out for me. Let's pull it in closer. This is a really tough camera angle. That's pretty close. All right, this is just about the world's toughest camera angle right here. Look at the tip of the pencil to the inside of the rim. And I'm looking for a concentric run right there. Don't worry about the flange, the outside. Don't worry about the step here, the OD, nothing. Right there in the center. That's what I'm focusing my whole world on. As soon as I can get that to run true, I will bring that center hub to run true and then flip the part around, do the same thing to the other side. But once this hub is running concentric, I have a good starting place. So. Whatever that cleans up at, that will be what I'll do to the other side, and then I'll hold them in a collet. Well, let's turn this about, uh, well, about, 100, about 100 RPM, and watch for it to run out. Try, not, I mean, put something on your monitor so you don't even look at this, but look at that small gap between the tip of the pencil and the wheel. That is incredibly close. My chuck is at the extent of its uh, adjustability here. You can see that the ID of the, uh, the center hub is still running out pretty good. Let's run that up to the 250 RPM max that the manufacturer recommends. And hope it doesn't fly out. Here we go. It's close, but it's not quite there. I am going to take that center hub and I'm going to knock that hub down, remove some of the eccentricity, and reverse this part. That should give me back some of the adjustability from the chunk. With a great deal of caution, this center hub was turned 10 thousandths at a time. Just about to get 
to the spokes themselves. This is a brazed carbide tool with a small 45 degree lead on it so that I could get close to the radius where the spokes terminate at the hub without leaving a hard line. The thought here is to make this a nominal diameter so I can hold it in a collet and reverse the part. And then I'll have more adjustability with the chuck since I've taken the air out of this side. And I like how it runs to the inside of the hub. Take a look. You can see the reflection in the small 45 that the tool left in the part, the eccentricity that was removed. I'll make sure this is a nominal size before I flip it around, and I may just put it back in a collet for the next operation. We'll see. Stay tuned. Let's talk about a very unique situation that we have here with a very unique solution. I just clamped on this diameter, which is running eccentric because the casting is split. You can see how it shifts to one side. That error will get worse it will neutralize and then it will return to the other side that way now the eccentricity that I am trying to dial out is greater than the movement of my adjustable chuck so here's the solution you hold it on the boss either one it doesn't matter go for a visual alignment which is closer to what you want to achieve and dust this boss accordingly. And by accordingly I mean clean it up. Now what you have now is you still have an eccentric relationship between what you want to have and what you just cut but is not nearly as drastic as the eccentric relationship on the opposite side. I hope this makes sense because this is we're going somewhere with this. Let's say this side is 30 thousandths out to where you want to be and your chuck only moves 20. Well, by grabbing here and shifting your chuck completely off center, you now have a ten thousandths error on this side to what you want to have. So by returning the newly turned side back into the chuck, you can now finish dialing out an error that's greater than the adjustability of your chuck because you've reduced that error by turning a pilot diameter. You will have to flip it, establish your concentricity, make a finish cut and then flip it again and make a finish cut to be concentric to the other side. That's the only way to get an error out of a part in a chuck bigger than the adjustability or throw of the chuck. Put this in a collet right now you would not be happy because I did. I put it in a collet and it's still just ever so detectable out here and I'll tell you when this thing is running I want this to look like it's not even turning so I'm not going to be happy until I'm there. I'm going to put it back in the chuck on the newly turned diameter here. Dial it in visually so this is running nearly perfect. And I'm going to go from there back to the chuck. I mounted an aluminum bar in one of my tool holders. And I am using that as a visual reference for the run out of this particular part. It can be very deceiving. You can use a wax pencil, you can use a marker, you can use a piece of chalk, whatever you want. I'm going on a visual gap right here. I'm looking at the face of the wheel against the spacer. Before I center drill it, I want to get it to run as close as possible. I did the same thing with the ID. You can probably use an indicator, but I don't believe in indicators on castings. I never have, never will. And by just moving it around, looking at the gap, I'm pleased with what I got. Center drill it, put a live center in, turn the OD. I'm going to have to turn the sound down for this one. I have a feeling this is going to ring like a doorbell. Let's see what happens.
until you have adequate support on this part, do not trust it. That is a very small bite I have on it. And I will not increase the RPMs until I have support. OD operation is first, and then I will probably reverse the jaws and do the faces. I will actually attempt one of the faces while it's set up like this. Ideally it would be uh, good to do both, that way you know they're exactly parallel. But I don't expect this to work, I really don't. Hope it does, let's see. Three hundred twenty RPM TPG insert, live center, gentle support. Fingers crossed. Here we go. Take your time. Ten thousandths at a time, total. This is going to take a while. All right, if I had any advice to give, I would say sand this sucker before you start this operation or you're going to be here for a month of Sundays. going to cut the film. I am going to take this five ten thousandths at a time until we start to clean up and then we can look at it from there. I've changed over to an uncoated insert with a little bit larger nose radius on it. I'm going to drag a wooden dowel against the face of this to absorb some of the harmony that the thing's going to give off. I'm surprised at the surface finish. It's actually not too bad. The interrupted turning was a little bit uh, aggressive and would have a tendency to ring the part but once the OD cleans up and it's a continuous cut uh, it's not too bad still running slow rpm still down around 350 400 rpm four hundred twenty five rpm Some of the indication on the OD showed me I had some hard spots in this material. It was real shiny as I was turning it. And we took a little bit to get under that. Let's clean up a little bit more. Please bear in mind that if you're going to use emery on a piece like this, take your cutting tool out, do yourself a favor, reduce the chance of injury. If your fingers slip in here, two things are going to happen. It's either going to kick it out or it's going to tear it off. Nothing good is going to happen if you get off your part and get in here. It's like sticking your fingers in a fan or a boat propeller. Be very aware this part is unassuming looking, but incredibly dangerous when it's spinning. Please be careful. Back to 425. I'm going to polish the OD, see if we can get some of these marks out. Actually, I'm going to try a nice flat file I got as a gift. Let's try it. Oh, I like the way that feels. That's pretty.
Sick of beauty. Let's face it off. Change over to a high speed steel tool. Forty five degree lead. Same tool I normally deep art with. Just kind of kick it in the holder. If the part's going to have a tendency to ring, the smallest amount of surface contact is advisable. With the tool, that is. It's a terrible feeling. <laughs> oh man, I knew that was going to happen. That is just an awful sound. This is where a six jaw chuck would come in absolutely wonderful. Support every 60 degrees. Three jaw with the jaws reverse is probably going to be okay. But it still would be nice to have a flat surface to bank against. So that's what I'm going to be shooting for. I might be shooting for a while. Let's try the deburred carbide. The moment you hear that chatter going on, you've got to get the tool off the part or all it's going to do is just dig a whole lot of deep troughs in the part. I'm going to sit back and scratch my head on this one for a minute, see if I can come up with some way to comfortably get that vibration out of there. All I need is a reference surface and then I can OD grip this part.
may be horrible, but it's pretty close to being flat. Just truly painful to look at. <laughs> All right, plan B, we're going for an OD grip right now. Not happy. Not happy. I am very pleased with the OD. It is nice and round. It is uh, relatively true to one side. That one side is extremely chewed up. And if you've been with this channel for a while, you know that this is my standoff trick for increasing the parallel ability of the parts that you want to turn. I am not banking on the jaws. I'm going to be banking on these towers, and those towers are turned in place or faced off in place, usually with the jaws out. So I have six points of contact, three points of grip, six points of support. So it should reduce the screaming somewhat and allow me to get a relatively decent finish on the face of this. We're also going to get a good look at how eccentric the inside of this part was running out when I just did the outside. Get ready for some serious ugly. Okay, the OD is running nice and smooth. The center hub is probably running out a little bit and you can see the thickness of the outer rim is eccentric. So that's gonna make it look like it's shaken, it's not. I do intend to clean that up after a facing cut. Let's see how it turns out. some voids in the casting at the top. I'd like to reduce them. I don't know if I'm going to cut them all the way out, but I will reduce them. I like it. Chant for the OD. If it's running out or squeezed too tight, you're going to see it now.
consistency in the chamfer would indicate some grip differences. So it should be bigger by the standoffs and smaller here, which is what I am witnessing. Let's see what it looks like while it's running. For sake of security, I'm going to face off the center. Just rest a live center against it with the bull nose. I don't like using live centers with just the points. I'm going to set up another tool with a much larger radius and I'm going to come in and I'm going to kiss this inside surface to get this outside track true to the OD. It should take out that eccentric whip that you can see right now. That's got to go. Just for reference sake I will also throw an indicator on that OD to make sure everything is running straight on. I did take the opportunity to reverse the part in the setup so the face that you just watched me face off is now against the standoffs. I indicated the OD and with a grip that I feel comfortable with I'm looking at about a 5,000th total uh, high low bounce on the indicator and that's to be expected. This is exceptionally thin and unless you strap this down to a face plate or a rotary table you are going to distort this if you squeeze it too hard. It's going to show up in the chamfers on the edge of the part and whatever else you think that you're going to get concentric. So with the 5 thou error, I do have a pressure cup on the front of my live center. It is just resting against the hub. There is no pressure against that. It's just sufficient to turn the live center. That's it. And I'm going to use a radius tool on the inside where that red mark is right there and I'm going to true up the OD to that particular recess for cosmetic purposes. I want to see that running true. This is a highly visible part and this is important. So I'm going to face it off, chamfer it, and then I'm going to go on the inside and take care of that as well. The tool that I'm using is a hand ground carbide, brazed carbide. And the radius is just about the same as the one on the casting. For sake of reducing the contact of the tool, I'm going to swap to a smaller radius. And I just happen to have laying around. This is going to act like a boring tool, so make sure you have clearance on the bottom of the tool when you set this. The diameter this big by eye would be fine. Camera got that. Zoom in on that area, show you how nice that looks. The inside 45, I think cosmetically that works quite well. It's 
It's a little irregular, but the outer land stays nice and true. And I think I'm going to leave well enough alone and stay with that one right there. I'm going to flip it around, do the exact same thing to the other side. Nice light grip, centered, and then I'm going to put it in a collet to bore it. Just feel better about that. This is strictly to clean this area up and make it look better than it does because I think it looks pretty crappy right now. I don't want to see anything running out. Nothing. Ugly. Let's see what we can do to make that go away. to hit the inside this time, no way around it. You don't have to, but I'm going to. See if I can get lucky on this one. Man, that's a lot. Reduce the projection on the tool. Let's see what we get.
Ah, clean it up. Why not? It's pretty. That is a thing of beauty. I'm very pleased with that. Very pleased with that. I'm going to turn it around, do the exact same thing to the other side. We'll take it out and bore it and call it. Pay attention to the diameters that you turn on the hubs on either side if you want to fit it in a standard size collet after the fact. One side of this one turned out to be 687, the other side is 673. This is not something you're going to see with the naked eye. And the reason I did that is because they both cleaned up at different places and I tried to keep them as close to nominal as possible. Indicate the face, make sure the ODs run it true. If everything worked out, the indicator shouldn't bounce much. This one's moving about. A uh, thousandth, maybe, plus four tenths, minus four, about eight tenths. Close enough for a flywheel on a steam engine model. So I'm going to drill and ream this center hub right now. I will double check the run out before I pass the reamer through it because that is the end of days when that happens. Whatever the hole is, that's what the outside is going to look like when we're done. Then I'm going to polish it up and show you what it looks like before we put the little hole in there. Now you've seen holes drilled and reamed a hundred times, so I'm going to sign off until I shine it up and hit the bench. So far, so good. I like it. I am extremely pleased with the way this came out. The handwork is going to take you some time. If you want it to look good when you're done, take your time on the handwork. Use small round files in these areas to keep the detail that was intended. The OD, eh, you know, I guess I could have got a better finish if I ground it. <laughs> but that was done with a 220, 400 emery, and then I used a 500 Norton uh, lapping paste on it. Just ran it up about 600 RPM and worked it in with a tissue. So that looks real good. 375 hole through the center. All the burrs are taken off. You will still encounter some degree of inconsistency in the wall here, depending on how aggressive you are deburring it. And even the radius itself that's on here when you're done is going to affect the way it looks like it's running. But this is a highly visible part. I can guarantee that it's going to be running within a thousandth or two every which possible way you could imagine when it's done. I do not have the five degree hole in it yet, but that is just redundant. I'm just going to put it in a vise on a couple of standing pieces of material pop the hole in doesn't have to be five degrees doesn't have to be ten degrees anything that gets in there and clears the outside is the intent but you know I figured I wanted to post this video so I'll show you how to do that in the next one I am really pleased with that look at that that is just beautiful Whoop. There you go. couldn't be happier fun little part tedious little part because it is gonna sing Get ready for the noise. But I think it worked out quite well. That is just gorgeous. I am very pleased with that. That was in the details, right? Love it. Thanks for watching. Stay well. Just as a preview of what I'm about to do, I'm not going to show drilling the hole. It's really, there's, there's no point to us just drilling and tapping a hole. It's all about the setup. And this is the setup I'm going to use. They're about seven or eight inch long, one by one pieces of aluminum. Scrap anything you can screw your part to or clamp your part to is going to do. I have a one, two, three block in the bottom between these two risers. 
The risers are set at the angle called out on the print, and I'm just going to use, well, I'm going to cheat and use an extended drill and tap to do this, but that's the setup. figured that was worth showing. If you do not have the vertical room on your machine to do this, and I'm sure this is going to be challenging for some of you, take this bottom block and make sure it's straight up and down and clamp that to your table. And then squeeze these directly off the table. Just use a bigger clamp on the bottom. That will buy you some room. This is uh, the way I'm going to do it, and I'm lucky enough to have a large machine. But if you don't, like I said, just make sure this this block right here is the one clamped to the table. Toe clamp it down, and then squeeze these outriggers on. Clamp the part to it. It's a very small hole, very low load, but you may need a pulley tap to do it. It's going to be a pretty tight squeeze in there to get that tap down in there. So maybe in the next video I'll show you how to make a pulley tap. For now, that's all we got. This time I'm genuinely out. Thanks a lot for watching. Joel Pine, Advanced Innovations. Stay well, people. And hopefully we all get through this together and healthy. Take care. I'm out.